Senator, I'm the Gloucester County Emergency Management Coordinator. And this is Bruce Sterling. I'm going to let him introduce himself in a minute so I don't mess it up. Um, he's from Virginia Department of Emergency Management. Mr. Crisco, Board of Supervisors at large is in the back. And uh, Chief Burgess from Abingdon Fire is here as well. We passed out a lot of cards, information, got it on the TV and the newspaper, so we're hoping in about 10 minutes the room is packed. Uh, but uh, in case it isn't, anything that you learn or any questions that you know somebody may have, just send them down back to us. We have some information back uh, at the table back there. We have opportunity to sign up for our mass notification system. If you don't have it, we're also uh, working on a survey that we'd like you to take. It'll just take a couple of minutes before you leave on whether or not you'd evacuate, what concerns you have, what might change your mind. So the reason we're having this is because when there's storms, especially flooding, it comes here first. So how many of you live down this end of the county? And how many of you live up by Little England and Bina and all that? Okay. So you all know about flooding. How many of you have flooded before? <laughs> okay. All right. So that's why we're here. We really want to get an idea of what your needs are to explain what we watch for, what the state looks for, what resources may or may not be available, and how to take care of yourselves, and what you need to do to get out when the first responders aren't going to be able to come in. So we really want to hear from you after Bruce presents and talk about what your needs would be, but what questions you have, and what we can do for you, and what we'll need from you during weather. So thank you for coming out tonight. Fine, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Bruce Sterling. I'm the Hurricane Program Manager for Virginia with the Virginia Department of Emergency Management. Jane and Ashby to come do this presentation. And just what I hope to do is when you leave here tonight, get a little bit more educated on, you know, we're, we're going to talk about our hurricane risk. We're going to talk about uh, some of the things you can do to uh, take protective actions and be better prepared when you leave here. Can everybody hear me OK? Okay. So I don't have to, since I don't have a remote, I'm going to have to stick behind this, uh, this podium so I can advance my slides. So, um, first I'm going to start off here just showing our, our hurricane district. So, these are all the tracks from uh, 19, or 1851 when we first started to keep the record, when the Weather Service started uh, keeping the record. These are all the tropical cyclones, which is anything from a uh, tropical depression all the way up to a hurricane. So it looked real cluttered here, but really most of these had no significant impact to Virginia. Most of them were uh, storms that made landfall somewhere else in a weekend and they were considered a tropical depression. The blue ones are tropical depression. So while they may have had a little bit of rain, uh, it really didn't do anything as far as an impact. We're going to talk about the, the, the few that have had major impacts in Virginia. But if you, if you figure just from the tropical side of things, this is minor compared to all the other storm systems that bring thunderstorms and, and other you know, frontal type systems where we have weather fronts come through and cause thunderstorms and tornadoes. So it's kind of really a bunch of white noise, if you will. But this next graph here shows you all the landfalls in the U.S. from 1950 to 2021. So basically 71 years of, of landfall. You see it's pretty busy. Just about every uh, part of the coastline all across the Gulf of Mexico and the Atlantic has had some category uh, of hurricane. One of the most notable things I'd like to point out. I thought you mentioned it. Do you remember, anybody here remember oh, the Hurricane yeah. Donna, 1960? Yeah. It wasn't a big one here, but on the eastern shore where I was, that's the one that they always talk about. Hurricane Donna had four landfalls in the United States. Uh, the first one was right down here. It's got, kind of hard to see this, I know. Right down here in the Keys, that came around and made landfall down in southwest Florida, came across and made landfall again. Those two were category four landfall. Made landfall again in North Carolina, and then went uh, parallel to the coast and made landfall again as a category three in Long Island. So but what, I, what I really want to point out here to you is this red line. There have been no hurricane landfalls in the last 71 years between the Outer Banks and uh, New Jersey where Hurricane Sandy made landfall in 2012. So don't let your guard down. That doesn't mean that we're not vulnerable to that. It just means 
that in the last 70 years we haven't had it. We've got a lot of close calls, and, and that's what I'm going to show you here with some of these next few slides. So these here are the, are the just the hurricanes. You know, we kind of weeded out all those other storms. These are the hurricanes that have come within 100 miles of Virginia's coast in the last 170 some years since 1851. And the thing you notice about the tracks that are pretty common to these? Say it again. Bypass. Yep. The, for the most part, they're all moving north, northeast. You know, our, our worst nightmare is a track coming in, making a direct landfall, coming in, you know, on the northwest track. By the time they come up here, generally most of the hurricane tracks are already started at the curvature and, and usually are off the coast. If they make landfall in North Carolina, uh, they come up and they're the tropical storm, tropical depression that we saw in that, that first slide. Can you highlight the coast? Say again? Can you highlight the coast? It's hard to make out. Um, highlight the coast or point out the coast. Oh, the coast, yeah. I'm sorry, yeah. It is kind of a, we turn the lights out, you probably see it better, but I don't want everybody to fall asleep. <laughs> Can you see it better with the lights out? <coughs> yeah, yeah, turn back on, you can't really see it. So the coastline, coastline comes up around, around right here. This is this is the handle room area. You can see this a whole lot better on the on you know, my screen, but with this projector, it's, it's not as high resolution. But right here is the Virginia coastline, the eastern shore of Virginia, and Virginia Beach right here in North Carolina. Okay. That's your point. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm looking at my screen here and it's a little bit higher resolution. These are all the category, all the hurricanes. It's about 66 that have come within um, 100 miles. Of, it's 100 nautical miles of Virginia's coast. These here are category one. I think you can probably see the as we get, you know, these two other slides and there's less of these storms. You can probably see the coast a little bit better. Again, you know, most of these are either offshore or they're uh, coming through, uh, making landfall in North Carolina and weakening by the time they come to Virginia. Now we're looking at the Category 2s, and again, most of those tracks are all already recurring. Uh, it's not making that direct landfall. There's a couple exceptions. We'll talk about those in just a second. And then here, here are the Category 3s. It's, it's only just a handful, seven or eight Category 3s that are within 100 miles. But the one I want to point out is that, that, that one with the curve, just based on our weather conditions, it could have easily made that curve a little bit more north and gone straight in, and we could have had a Category 3 in Virginia's coast. Category fours, there's only two. One's Hurricane Hazel. Many of you may have remembered Hurricane Hazel that made landfall in North Carolina. Uh, became extra tropical in North Carolina. So by the time it came into Virginia, it was uh, lost its tropical characteristic, but it was still a pretty powerful storm that came up through central Virginia. Then we had Hurricane Willie, which uh, threatened North Carolina, gave them a scare that turned off and, and went out to sea and didn't bother anybody. But you don't see any category threes or fours that have come through Virginia, right? Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean it's never happened. We'll talk about that in just a second. But category fives, uh, I don't have a slide on category fives, and that's because there are none. Uh, we have, uh, we, fact, we don't plan for a category five hurricane in Virginia or north of North Carolina. And for the most part, I mean, by the time they, they get this far up north, one, they're losing the, you know, the, the warm water, which they need. Uh, even though we have the Gulf Stream, it's just not enough to maintain that category five uh, strength, but also, this far up in latitude, they're starting to transition to extra tropical storms. They're starting to get bigger and lose their intensity a little bit more. But this is a slide of all the Category 5 hurricanes in, uh, on record since, not just near Virginia, but in the Atlantic Basin since uh, 1871. There's 38 of them, only 38 Category 5. And usually, category, this, this only a Category 5 storm for a very short period of time. They just can't maintain. That, that high intensity of a, a, a storm for that long. So what I wanted to show you here, the other thing, this, these dots here are the, the northernmost latitude of any Category 5 hurricane. So the, the high, most north latitude is Hurricane Camille back in 1969 when it made landfall in Biloxi, Mississippi. Uh, and then Hurricane Michael in 2018 was right behind it, not too far behind it, but but Camille was the highest, the northernmost a storm has ever been in Category 5. So it kind of shows you, you hear people talk about Category 5s making landfall here. It's never happened, and most likely probably never will. I've been told by the, the Weather Service that it's meteorologically impossible. Now, whether that's true or not, I don't know. But, but 
but basically uh, we, this, this record speaks for itself. Now one thing I will mention is the one up here, the 1944 uh, in the Atlantic coast, that was just uh, recategorized as a Category 5 in September. So the, the Hurricane Center will, if they find newer data, they'll go in there and they'll reanalyze these storms. And uh, Hurricane Andrew was 10 years before they categorized it as a, a Category 5. So uh, there was 37 up until September. It was now 38, and it's probably shortly going to be 39 because a couple of weeks ago they just uh, made it official that uh, Hurricane Ian in Florida was a Category 5 right before landfall. But I didn't make it didn't make uh, landfalls a Category 5, but it was a Category 5 for a brief period of time right on the shore. The other thing I, I do want to point out, we hear about, you, you probably hear in the news all the time about, you know, the, all these more intense hurricanes and everything. Well, I do want to point out something. Right here, right here was a 1932. Down here is 1932. Right here is 1933. And right here is 1933. So we had four category five hurricanes in two years back in the 1930s. So yeah, I, I don't know about all the hype about you know local warming's causing more hurricanes. It very well may be. The point is we did have those in the past. It's not something that's, that's you know, unprecedented. <laughs> now these here are all the storms and all the hurricanes that came through Virginia. This is probably more relevant than what we're talking about. You know, we, see them go offshore, we see them go to North Carolina, but what's come through Virginia? Well, we've got 11 of them in 170 years. These are two here I want to talk about uh, most. Uh, Hurricane uh, Isabel in 2003, and then uh, the 1933 Chesapeake Potomac Hurricane, which is this top one. That's our worst case scenario. That's the one that keeps anybody who plans for hurricanes awake at night. That's our worst case track. Where because the the most the heaviest winds and the most storm surge is going to be on the right side of the storm. Bless you. This track here uh, will push all that water right over Chesapeake Bay, and it's, it's, you know, it's, we'd rather see that track make in north of the Chesapeake Bay, where it doesn't really push as much water up. Uh, it'd be a whole lot better scenario for us. This is our worst case track. It was only Category One hurricane when it made uh, when it came through Virginia, but this here has given us our record uh, flooding level for Virginia. You know, it's about, at Sewell's Point, it's a little bit more than eight feet above uh, mean lower low water. Like Hurricane Isabel was just uh, below that, it's our number two. Uh, but in Hurricane Isabel, if you remember, I'm sure most everybody here remembers Hurricane Isabel. Hurricane Isabel, by technica technically, was a category two when it entered in Virginia. Um, you know, at the time when uh, we went through Isabel, our area here only saw tropical force winds. So the, the track went in through North Carolina, in through interior Virginia, but the outer fringes uh, were a little bit weaker than, than the center core where the hurricane winds were. So we experienced tropical storm force winds, and if you remember, we made a pretty big mess here. A big power outage, a big uh, a debris and tree down event. So the reason I'm saying that is, if you hear it was just a tropical storm, remember what Isabel did. And, and really, that's probably, for most of us, that's probably the worst we've seen. So, you know, category one, two, or three hurricane. Uh, category three, really our, our, our nightmare scenario that we plan for our worst case. Any questions about these? This is, these are the last of the tracks. And the 33 storm, that's a category one. I didn't hear you. The 1933 storm, mm -hmm. it's a category one. It was a category one. It was a category two, just as it approached the other banks. It was a category one that came through Virginia, that was Chesapeake Bay. Yeah. Now, there was another another 1933 storm that came right off the coast and went parallel to the coast. It didn't make landfall, but it was about a month later. This was in August 23rd. Uh, this was the other one in September. So you can imagine, you just had this storm come through and you got another one off the coast threatening you. It's probably a little keep, keep people worried. How many of you guys flooded in Ernestville? Do you remember? If you were here, my neighbor. And don't, if you've got any questions, don't hesitate. Don't just stop me, and um, you know we'll, we'll take care of it. But I'd rather answer them as we go than get to the end and forget it.
minute after we finish, <clears throat> if we haven't discussed anything or answered a question, you know, we have an open discussion, anybody can bring up anything you'd like to. Now, uh, I, I said, you know, these, you can't really go by what we saw here. This is a really, a relatively small window of time, 170 years. There are uh, recorded um, documentation of other storms that have impacted us, which could probably relate to a category two, three, or four storms. Uh, the first one being in 1667, where the bay rose 12 feet above normal. That's consistent with, you know, category three, maybe a four hurricane. 1749 is actually what caused, created Willoughby Spit. Uh, hurricanes in 1749, um, the bay rose 15 feet, and that storm in conjunction with the one in 1806 is what formed Willoughby Spit uh, that we know now, right now where the Hempford Bridge Tunnel is. And then in 1821, uh, we have a storm surge estimated of 10 feet from Chesapeake Bay. We haven't seen any of this and those storms that I just showed you in record. So the point is, it might not have happened in the last 170 years, but it has happened in the past, and it probably won't happen again. So now that we've talked about you know, the history, I'll talk a little bit about impacts and um, and, and would you know, help you understand more about you know the, the repercussions of the hurricane, what, what they expect. I know um, I think actually you asked if you anybody has seen the flooding in the past, or maybe it's Jane, somebody somebody has actually. Uh, yeah, we've seen a lot of flooding, but we've not seen anything like what we're going to talk about here in the past, thankfully. So basically these are the four four uh, hazards from hurricanes are Storm, our storm surge, which is the water that comes off the ocean, uh, winds, inland flooding, and tornadoes. And just so everybody knows, when we're, when we're planning for evacuations and we ask you to evacuate, we're only evacuating because of storm surge. We don't evacuate because of wind, unless you live in a mobile home or a, a camper or a substandard home. If you are outside of the, the flood risk, then we expect everybody to, to stay put. Because if, if everybody evacuated, we're just not getting everybody out. In fact, we worry about getting the people who really need to get out now in the amount of time that we need to. This here is uh, a uh, graphic that uh, the director of the National Hurricane Center showed us a couple weeks ago at the National Hurricane Center. This is looking at the last 10 years of direct uh, fatalities, or fatalities from direct uh, impacts of hurricanes. Uh, where we also have indirect, which is past the storm. We have things like people getting electrocuted or, or uh, carbon monoxide, that sort of thing. So, historically, our, we always said 90% of the, the hurricane deaths were from storm surge. This is from you know, years ago, you know, back in uh, 1900, there was a big uh, hurricane down in Galveston where 3,000 people were killed because of storm surge. And that's probably where a lot of those numbers came. Over time, we've gotten better at warning people. People have taken, you know, they, they become more smarter that we got a hurricane coming, I'm at risk, I need to evacuate. And really, the, the storm surge fatalities have made up a small, it's only 11% uh, in the last 10 years, where freshwater flooding has been our, our biggest uh, risk from hurricanes historically. So uh, you see 57% in uh, freshwater flooding. But if you look at all flooding, um, you have 57 percent from freshwater level for storm surge, and then we have 15 for rip currents and, and people have to surf. You know, storm comes, surf come up, see people heading to the out banks and surfing, um, and they just, you know, you know, a lot of people, you know, a deadly mistake. So I'm going to talk here. I'm trying to explain this uh, to everybody without confusing you on how we come up with a storm surge. And you've probably seen those, you know, in the past we used to have maps that would show you what areas would flood in a Category 1 hurricane and Category 2 and 3 and so forth. Uh, remember the, the newspaper or the uh, weather station used to put, put them out in the newspaper in the big flyers. And so we stopped doing that, and I'll explain why in a few minutes just to avoid confusion. But uh, we have what we call, um, we run, the Hurricane Center runs modeling that, that models the storm surge. For us. And, and they do this through uh, a software called SLOSH. It stands for C 
sea land, sea lakes, overland surges and hurricanes. Just uh, the model that the Hurricane Center uses to, to run and, and figure out how much uh, storm surge we're going to have from a hurricane. So before an event, you know, for planning purposes, uh, each state has a what they call a basin, a storm surge basin. Our basin is the Chesapeake Bay Basin. And it's, you can and see this arc up here that overlays uh, the land. This is, if you can imagine, this uh, represents several very small grids. Uh, and, and they're about a quarter of a square mile. Uh, each grid uh, makes up this big area here. And what, what the Hurricane Center will do is uh, they will run a uh, storm scenario and they'll take, they'll start off with this direction here. So we're looking at a northeast direction, right? You see these, can you all see the lines okay? The tracks, so those are, the, are different tracks that uh, they run on the storm. So we'll take that first track all the way at the top and they'll run that, this, they'll run it as a category one hurricane, moving five miles an hour. And then the model from that will populate each one of those grids on what the, the water elevation is. Make sense? And they'll run that same scenario again at 10 miles an hour. And it'll repopulate the highest level for each grid. And they'll do it for, for 20 miles an hour, 30, 40, and 50. Then they'll do the same thing for the next track down. And they'll keep running it all the way across. And when they do that, it'll come up with this area that you see right here, this color coded. It'll, it'll take a composite, the highest of all those model runs will, will give you this, these values of what the storm surge would be. And that would be what we call a maximum envelope of water. We refer to it as a meow. So it would be at the meow for category one northeast track. Does that make sense? That could be, it's really confusing, but I hope I explained it well. And Jane, if you can understand it, I know we, everybody else is like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like to pick on Jane every once in a while. But that, does that make sense what I was saying? So they'll do the same thing, they'll just the category one, northeast direction. They'll do the same thing for northeast direction. They'll do the same thing for north direction, north, northwest, northwest, west, northwest, and parallel to the coast. So each one of them is a category one me out for each direction. Then they'll do the same thing for category two, category three, category four. And all this about 16,000 different runs to get us these uh, these estimates of what the storm surge flooding will be. So those are what we use. And so if we have a hurricane coming, it's, it's far out in the ocean, and we say, okay, if we're thinking this is gonna be a category two hurricane. Uh, it might make a direction of, you know, a northwest track. We'll pull up that category two northwest meow, and that'll give us a good estimate of what we're dealing with and, and the impact that we have. That really fit into how we developed our evacuation zones also. Now, there's also what we call a mom. That's the maximum of meow. That's that map I was telling you about a while ago that when you see uh, what would flood for a category one or category two, that's really a the same thing, a composite of all those meows for each different category. So it's really probably hard to see here. These, we used to have these in like red, blue, uh, orange, and, um, and yellow, but since our evacuation zones use that same color, we didn't want to use that for this and confuse people. So uh, we use this paint. And this comes out of our hurricane evacuation study, which uh, is what we really sort of base of all our hurricane planning. But anyway, this is this kind of shows you if what we use the moms for is if you want to buy a house, you say, I don't want to buy a house that's in the category four flood zone, you look at this map and, and just get something out there. That's really uh, the main purpose that we use for that. So those, any questions about that? That's what we use for pre-hurricane uh, planning. That's what we use for planning um, in a general sense. Now, operationally, when there's a storm out there, um, the Hurricane Center will run the slosh model on that storm. So little, instead of having all these different scenarios and characteristics, they're using the parameters from that, that storm that we're dealing with right now. Just a little bit more realistic, uh, so more refined, and uh, in the meows and the beyond and the moffet, any one of those, the one storm not going to call all that flooding, if that makes sense, since it's a composite. This here is an example of the potential storm surge graphic that the Hurricane Center produces. You've probably seen some of the other 
graphics of Hurricane Center shows, and I'll show you some of those in a minute about the tracks and the cones and everything. This here is uh, another graphic that they provide, but this is, comes about an hour later. This is an hour later after the, the hurricane package, advisory package comes out. But they gotta take that forecast, uh, storm surge unit does, takes the forecast, then they have to run additional models. It takes about an hour. They run this thing through 900 different model runs to come up with this, uh, this map. One point I wanna make out is this isn't a forecast. This is a flooding potential. So this is a worst case scenario. So, you know, look, this is actually from Hurricane Ian. Uh, so if you were to look at this, uh, it, if you really didn't know what you're looking at, you would say, all this area in, in red is gonna get more than nine feet of flooding. And, and that's not what this, this means. This means that it's the potential, it's the maximum potential for up to nine feet. Not everybody's gonna get that. And the way they, they do these, uh, they, they call this a 10% exceedance. And what that means is this graph, there's a 10, only a 10% chance that it can be higher than this. Okay, so it's, it's really a worst case scenario. The other graph that they provide, and up until uh, through last year was experimental, this year it's going to be operational, is the peak storm surge graph. This is a forecast. So this is something you can look at and say, okay, right around uh, this front of, of uh, Fort Myers, we're looking at 12 to 16 feet of storm surge. Okay, so this is something, if you see this, you want to pay attention to this. Any questions? Okay. I'm going to show you real quick, um, we talked about the meows. I'm going to show you what it means for Gloucester County. So this here is a category one meow. We're, looking, we're using the northwest tracks and the west northwest tracks, our two uh, worst case tracks. And you can see on flags, these flags are in different areas uh, down in, in this area. Um, most, there are some that say dry, but that means that there's no, no uh, flooding. And these numbers are all above ground level. So we see on the far edge four, that's four, that's four feet of water above ground. This is what a Category 1 hurricane. You see areas that you all probably see flood on more of the nuisance storms and more routine. But you're going to see four feet in those worst case areas. Some areas are three feet, some areas are two feet with a Category 1 hurricane. Of course, it's going to be out. So not everywhere is going to see these exact. This is probably going to be your, yep, your, a good, a good uh, restaurant. Usually, uh, these are within 10%, 10 to 20% uh, either way. Category two, we go up to a little bit more. So now we got, so we had four feet, now we got seven feet. You can imagine seven feet is taller than, than, than I am. Um, seven feet, six feet, five feet, for the most part on those, those areas near your coast. It doesn't really, it goes in a little bit more, but then you'll see here in a minute, that pretty much stops um, where your elevation becomes uh, pretty consistent. Category three, now we're at 10 feet, nine feet, eight feet, and most of the area is just west of here. And you see that ridge right just, just east of 17, where uh, it pretty much stops. Everything west of that is going to be on higher ground. And then category four, 11, 12, 13 feet in a lot of these areas. You can just imagine how high that is. And this will, if you hear a hurricane center, uh, they, they did this during Ian, they did this during Hurricane Laura and Hurricane Ida. They start having term, you know, messaging saying this is unsurvivable. These conditions are unsurvivable. You're trying to get your attention, and if you see that, and you live in an area that, you know, you're in an evacuation zone, and there's an evacuation order, you really need to, to pay attention to that. It's a lot of water. And again, we've never seen this. This is category four, so I showed you that category four graphic, uh, but we saw some of the references to 10, 12, 15 feet of a storm surge in Chesapeake Bay back in the 1600s, 1700s. Okay. Any questions about that before we, uh, we're going to shift gears here and go into flood insurance rate maps.
the, the, the map you use from flood insurance, which is a completely different map. They're not related. Uh, there are great maps. Uh, those are, back in 1968, uh, the, the National Flood Insurance Program was uh, created. And the reason for that was, you know, as most people probably know, uh, homeowners insurance does not pay for flooding. So if you don't have flood insurance and you get flooded, you're, you're going to be out of pocket. The insurance company will not pay. And so um, in 68, we created the National, insurance, National uh, Flood Insurance Program to be able to help people with federally funded, federally backed uh, flood insurance. So the way it works, though, is the locality has to agree to adopt certain floodplain management uh, regulations. Um, you, you have to, to, if you build new homes, you got to be above the base flood elevation, and there's other regulations. I'm not a floodplain manager, so I can't really speak too much on that. But the agreement is if the locality adopts, you know, the, you know, these uh, plan plans and policies, then you're eligible for flood insurance. So if the okay, I, I, there's only probably a handful, if any, in Virginia that don't participate. But if a county decided uh, we don't want to participate or they don't follow the rules and they get kicked out of the flood insurance program, what that means is nobody in the county can get flood insurance. So it's, it's really important you know, for all this. Luckily, we don't have that problem. But that's, that's the reason for the flood insurance program. So these flood maps, uh, we have to identify, y'all probably heard the 100 year flood and the 500 year flood. In FEMA terms, it's the 1% and the 0.2%. So what it means, is it doesn't mean that it only happens once every 100 years. It means that it's a 1% chance every year that that area can flood. And in the 500 years, a 0.2% chance. So it could certainly have you know, a 100 year flood this year, another one next year. I remember uh, back in 98, uh, I was in Portland at the time as a emergency manager, and we had 200 year floods uh, a week apart in 1998. Uh, they were both coastal and northeastern. So this, it also established the base flood elevation, uh, and you would think that water is one level, and that you have one base flood elevation that covers everything, but it's not that simple. And I'll show you some examples here in a minute on how that looks. But if you have, say, the base flood elevation is uh, six feet, that means when you build a home, you have to build your home with the, the first floor above six feet to be able to, to meet the public regulations. And the other difference is when we say six feet, on the flood charts now, six feet means six feet above uh, NABD 88 or sea level. We're talking about six feet above sea level, but on these storm surge maps I was showing you, six feet would be six feet above ground level. So they're two different things. All right, so when you look at the flood insurance uh, rate maps, uh, the first thing you're going to see is the, 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 the map index. So this here is for Gloucester County. And can you everybody see those little squares on the maps in the county here? What they are, those are individual map towns. So each one of those is going to be County's big enough where we have to have multiple NAS panels because uh, they're, they're fairly high resolution. And uh, you would uh, just, they got a number on it, can't read it from here. In fact, I can't even read it online. But there is a number, uh, a map number uh, that's uh, unique to each floodplain map. <coughs> and you just go to that map and open the map and you can see more detail. So, what I'm going to do is, where this little arrow is here, we're going to open that map panel up. And this is what it looks like. So you, over on the left, it's got notice to users, basically instructions, uh, anything you need to know to explain how to use the map. Over on the right is your legend. So it shows uh, various different boundaries, um, the 100 year, 500 year zones, and a bunch of other uh, stuff that makes you able to interpret that map. <coughs> so we're gonna, I know you can't see that, so I'm gonna try to help you out a little bit. We're gonna, Zoom in on that place where that box is here. Can everybody see this okay? So I'll come here and try to explain it a little bit better. Right here you have zone AE. The zone A is going to be your 100 year floodplain. So that's what uh, zone AE is. And it's kind of hard to see it, but right here it has in parentheses PL and a number. Uh, so that, that would be the base flood elevation. I can't really read what they are, but this is 
this is one area. This little white line will, will divide. Uh, say this is four and this is five, right? So that, that white line kind of divides. That's why I was saying that you think water is all one level, but the maps do have different uh, elevations for different places. Anybody ever seen one of these? So when you fold it up, kind of folds up like the old road maps you used to get at the gas station years ago. So and I'll show you how you can download these too in just a minute. <coughs> the other option you have is to go online. And this here is an online map of the same exact thing we were just looking at, except the blue box there is that map panel we just were looking at. So you can see some you know, differences here. This here is in color, it's easy to read. You can see how it relates to the other map panels. Just so you know, everybody in this room, if you've ever gone to the Gulfshire County website, our GIS department has these overlays built in to our mapping system. So if you don't download this, you can go to the Gloucester County site, search for your parcel, pull it up, and you can add these based on the maps in, in our GIS on our website, county website. Very, you got a very good website, probably better than most, and I'll show you that in a minute. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, you can see, you can, this, this, the legend's all the same. There are two icons up here. This one here, this is, uh, the map service center is where this is, and there's a link right to the county from the county's website to get you there. So you can go to their website and get everything you need to know. This here, you can download that, that map panel by clicking this button. Because, or, or this map panel, which is that one. The other thing, this one here, um, click on that, it makes what's called a firm map. The other one's a, a firm, a flood chart break map. So a firm map is where it's a smaller, map um, usually on an eight and a half by eleven page and you can zoom in right to where your house is and move it around and, and just kind of navigate to where you want to print that and it'll print the, the legend and everything else with a smaller uh, area of, of, of footage so the firm map you know you, you really probably are only interested in your your home your property and so that's what the firm is the rest the the dynamic so you can click on, on either one of them and as actually mentioned, uh, the website, <coughs> uh, it's got a lot of good information about that. Uh, the, the link to get to the, the flood insurance rate maps is uh, right here. Flood, flood hazard map. No, down here. So just go to the website, type in floods, and you'll have that whole list and, and look at uh, several different pieces. Download it, scroll around. Any questions? I want to change gears here again. So, any questions about flood maps, flooding, anything like that? Bruce, can I add one more thing? Huh? Can I add one more thing real quick? Sure. Yeah. And, and Gloucester County participates in several programs. So, if you are required to buy flood insurance in Gloucester County, you are currently getting a 20% discount because of the things that we do to mitigate the flooding. So you talked about base elevation for your home. You build a new home in one of these areas, you have to build that home plus an extra foot in Gloucester County. That's one of the things that we have, the board has implemented to help us fight these, these ever-growing uh, flood insurance rates. They've gone up this year, they're expecting them to go up even more um, in the next couple of years as more storms like Ian hit the coast um, and cause the amount of damage that they do, those flood insurance rates are going to continue to climb. Uh, I think we have one more level to get the 25%. Um, I think it's going to be higher than that. The amount of paperwork that it would take for us to keep those ratings uh, would probably have to, would, would cause us to have to open a, a new department of government in Gloucester County that did nothing but log paperwork to fight and, and, and keep management of all this. And it would probably take six people year round to keep us at more than 25%. So we're, we're, our goal is to get to 25 in the next year. And what Ashley's talking about is called a community rating system. So it, it's it's uh, voluntary. Like I said, you know, it's something that if the county uh, decides they want to get additional benefits, uh, you can get extra credits. And thanks for bringing it. A lot of these maps and a lot of what uh, Mr. Crisco was just talking about is going to be mailed out to every resident at the beginning of. Uh, May uh, as part of the Beehive publication. It's a whole flood awareness guide. 
that's part of what gets us their credit for CRS. So you'll be seeing a lot of those maps in that guide coming straight to your mailbox uh, in a few more weeks. Good. Anything else? All right, so now I'm going to talk about, uh, we talked about the hazards. Now we're going to start talking about what you can do to be better prepared and uh, protect yourself. And we'll start off first with watching the mornings. And I'm sure everybody's heard, you know, uh, watching the mornings we talked about. But I'm, just in case you haven't, I'm going to just go through these real quick. Uh, first thing we have is a tropical storm watch or warning. So a tropical storm watch uh, uh, is issued within 48 hours of the arrival of tropical storm force winds. Um, and then a warning would be 36 hours. So, you know, if it's, uh, that's one of the things you want to watch. You know, don't want to put too much emphasis on the cone or, or the track or anything. This is really what you need to pay attention to these watches or warnings. Hurricane watch in the morning uh, is when there are hurricane conditions. Uh, uh, watches, you know, when they're possible at 48 hours, this is when you need to start taking your, your uh, protective action. You know, get lawn furniture in or stuff off out of your yard, securing that. Uh, start to, if you have an emergency plan, start to kind of rush up on that, figure out if I've got to evacuate, where I'm going to go, uh, start doing those types of things now. Once there's a hurricane warning issue, if, if there's an evacuation order given, if you live in the evacuation zone, you really need to go ahead and, and start evacuating. And then the last is a storm surge watching one. This is fairly new. This is this has only been in existence since 2017. <laughs> and uh, this is, you know, the watch is the possibility of threatening inundation in 48 hours, uh, whereas the warning is the danger of life-threatening inundation in 36 hours. And uh, this, uh, Cody Fritz, who's the, the leader of the storm surge unit at the National Hurricane Center, I've heard him say over and over, when I issue a storm surge warning, I mean it. So you really, this here is probably the one thing you need, to, uh, the most important thing is a storm surge warning. If that's if that issue, you really need to pay attention. Because as I mentioned, that's why we evacuate. We don't evacuate for wind, we evacuate for storm surge. We actually haven't been under hurricane warning since uh, Hurricane Irene in 2011. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's, we're overdue. Uh, we hope, uh, this year is uh, not going to be the year, but you just never know. And every year we get to November, the end of November, we kind of breathe that side of the week that we made it through another one. Then the last one I want to show here is the inland wind warning. This here is issued by the National Weather Service. The top three are issued by the National Hurricane Center. The bottom one, the, the, the extreme wind warning, is issued by the uh, Wakefield National Weather Service office. If there are winds that exceed 115 miles an hour. So basically, that is the eye wall of a, a major hurricane. So if, if uh, an eye wall is coming up the bay uh, and, you know, a, a major hurricane, then that's a, a scenario where they could issue that. that that's, a, that's within an hour. That's the other you know, we're talking about 36, 40 hours. This is, this is going to happen within the next hour. Any questions on watching the morning? OK. How many people see these spaghetti models on TV or a newspaper? Or if you're on the internet at Mike's Weather page or, or wherever, there's a storm out there and they're looking at the models and, and all these armchair meteorologists trying to figure out where the hurricane is going to go. Well, I'll tell you, the hurricane center is, will tell you they don't know where it's going to go. So to try to, to outguess them is probably not the best thing. Uh, this here is, I don't know if anybody remembers Hurricane Joaquin back in 2015. Um, what I'll show you is Hurricane Joaquin is right here. And the, the, the forecast track is right now moving southwest. The forecast track has a turn coming up. You have a lot of models that are coming this way. You have this one model coming this way. This black line right here, this is the Hurricane Center forecast. Look at all these models that say it's going to go that way. The very next advisory, the Hurricane Center forecast is coming right up to Chesapeake Bay. Any idea where Joaquin went? No, this way. So 
be careful on the models. Uh, one thing I will say is um, this graph here, what I want to show is, is the skill level, the, the consistency of the difference between the models and the hurricane center forecast. And that black line up at the top is the hurricane center forecast. So on average, and this is from 2019, and, and today, uh, 2000, last year, the, they're still improved. So their hurricane center's forecasts are almost always going to be better than the models are. So, it, you know, they're not always better, but most of the time they are. So if you, uh, best thing to do is stick with the hurricane center forecast. We'll use the models if uh, the hurricane center doesn't have a forecast out yet. If there's a, 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 a disturbance out there, uh, and we need to have something to act on. And, you know, we'll look at the model to see where it's going to go. Or, you know, the Hurricane Center's forecast only go out five days, so we may want to see, okay, what's the model saying beyond five days? That's pretty much the limitation that we use. If the model is saying one thing, the Hurricane Center saying another thing, we'll always go for the Hurricane Center saying. So, everybody's seen this, I'm sure, uh, Hurricane Track. And um, this here is actually Hurricane Ian. Uh, about this is five o'clock, uh, the, the morning before landfall. So we're talking about maybe 28, 29 hours prior to landfall. And this is the tracking time. And so if you're in Sarasota, that's that's showing a direct hit at Sarasota in 48 hours. What are you thinking? Huh? Evacuations. Might be thinking, hey, I'm pretty safe here. We're saying 48 hours is going to hit here. And that's one thing. There, there's a lot of uncertainty in forecasts. And they want, you know, they, they publicize that. The, the Hurricane Center, they had their way, they would do away with that black line. They don't want people to forecast on a track. A lot of times what happened, though, people will forecast on that track. And this, this did happen in the end. Uh, people down in Fort Myers said, it's going to Sarasota, Tampa, we're okay. And didn't look at the forecast again. So this forecast is probably going to change. And if the hurricane center, like I said, they have their way, they eliminate that black line. They tried to about 10 years ago, and the Mercy Man who protested so much that they just left it. So <laughs> this is probably something you everybody's seen. You know, this cone here. Does anybody know what the cone means? Anybody think it's like an average of all the models? Or think maybe it's the, the area of impact, where it's going to have impact? Huh? That's what, that's what most people think. This is the, the impact area. But the reality of it, this has nothing to do with impact or models. The only thing this here represents is the level of uncertainty. Just the, the average error of the Hurricane Center forecast. The only thing this cone means is that two thirds of the time, in the last, with the average of the last five years of averages of errors, it's going to be within this cone. Which means what for the other third of the time? It's going to be outside, of it, right? So I don't know if everybody's really following the news, but the Hurricane Center. Got a lot of criticism for a bad forecast for Hurricane Ian because they were forecasting for to go up to Tampa and went to Fort Myers. Well, if you remember right, the models, the models were all the way over New Orleans. The models were all over the place. In fact, Hurricane Center's forecast about 24, 48 hours before this one was the exact track that it took. I mean, it was a perfect forecast at that point. But the model started shifting west, and the hurricane center started falling. One thing you never will see the hurricane center do is flip flop. They'll make very small increments, and they did it. They did it here. They had it up up around Tallahassee at one point before they brought it back, and that's the track. So with that, I mean, they made a pretty good forecast. I mean, it was within that two thirds of the time of the average error, right? So the one thing that we don't want you to do is focus on the cone or focus on the skinny black line, which, which they call it. This was, like I said, this is 20, 
28 hours before landfall, they already had a hurricane warning zone for the area that was impacted. They had a hurricane warning from Fort Myers all the way up to Tampa. People should have been warned. They also had storm surge warnings up all along the western Atlantic coast more than 24 hours before landfall. In fact, that was 5 o'clock Tuesday morning. That whole area had a storm surge watch, 11 o'clock Sunday night. So nobody should have been surprised. However, 41 people died in the storm surge. That's almost as many as that died in the past 10 years in that graphic I showed you. Really, no, no reason that should have happened. This is a graphic, if you're gonna look at the cones, this is the one you wanna look at. This one here shows the cone with the winds. So it shows that the, the winds, if the, the storms, if the storms track on one side of the cone to the other. It's a wide area, but it's it's probably, it's, if you wanna focus on that, you're gonna focus on the cone and all. The main thing, the watches, no warnings. If there are watches and warnings, those are really what you need to be paying attention to. Any questions? All right, I'm gonna talk about evacuations here. So these here, we have four evacuation zones um, in Virginia, A, B, C, and D. And you see them shown on this map here. And these were based, we, we built these based off the meows I was talking about. So the way we did it is if, a, if we took the meows from north tracks to west northwest tracks and used that area that would flood the category one storm. And that was zone B. The northeast tracks was zone A. So that's kind of how we did it. And, and it's sort of based on category and 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 uh, the meows that will be in it. In in Virginia, our risk, these are our risk populations. So we got 287,000 people who live in zone A. And zone B, this is all cumulative, so zone B includes zone A. Okay. 620,000 people, over half a million people in zone A and B. So we have to do a zone B evacuation. That's how many people are at risk. Zone C, over a million, and zone D, a million and a quarter. So you've got to, imagine, you've got to do a zone D evacuation trying to get that many people to safety. And, and we're not asking them to go to Richmond. If, if you evacuate, you just go, really all you have to do is go to the zone that we're not evacuating. Just, you know, the, the shorter distance you have to go, the better. If you got family and friends, that's best. Our planning assumption, we know that all these people aren't going to evacuate. It will never happen. We've got 100% of the people evacuating. So we plan on our assumption that 80% will evacuate. And that's really a high assumption because the national average is somewhere between 65 and 70. But for planning purposes, to make sure we have enough time, to make sure we have enough shelters, we assume that 80 of the people are going to evacuate, which is this number right here. And we're still looking at a quarter of a million people in zone A uh, having to evacuate. Almost a half a million in, in B, three quarters of a million in C, and over a million in zone D. And how long is that going to take? Right here. So for us to evacuate zone A, we're looking at a 38 hour clearance time. And what a clearance time is, what that means is from the time the first car gets on the highway to leave until the last car gets to safety. It's not the time it takes you to go from point A to B. It's the time, the time it takes from that first person that leaves to the last person gets to safety, what we call the clearance time. Zone B, we had to evacuate zone B 45 hours. We barely have a, a, a hurricane watch in effect at this time. We're, we're talking, we don't even have a hurricane warning, so to try to get people to move, uh, that's how long it's gonna take. But we know that people probably aren't gonna leave that, that far out as, as like they should. Zone C, 58 hours, and almost three days, 67 hours for zone D evacuation. I know it'll never happen. I think the reality is that we call for a zone, say a zone C evacuation, 58 hours ahead of time, people are gonna wait to see what's gonna happen because you still got a storm out there with a lot of uncertainty, and and we just we just don't have the time. We can't wait till the last minute. 
takes that much time to get people through the work. I mean, we only got a certain amount of room with capacity to get people out. I think what's probably going to happen is in that last 24 hours, people are like, oh, yeah, this is really going to happen. We need to get out of here. And the roadway can be jammed, and a lot of people that need to get out probably won't. I think that's the reality. What does that mean for Gloucester? So this is this is your evacuation zone. And most of this area we saw with the heavy flooding is zone A. You all have a big zone A area. And then we got some small areas that are zone B. There are no zone C areas in, in Gloucester. You go from zone B to right to zone D, which is those blue areas. Basically, zone D, this area right here, and right over here. So if um, those are the populations. <laughs> but not very much, but again, we want everybody to be safe. So how do you know which zone is it? Anybody know what evacuation zone you live in? Which zone do you live in? A. A. I think Jane's going to try to get everybody to do a survey and, and, and try to get some, some of this information. Anonymous, right? So, but if you don't know your what zone you live in, if you all live down here, probably most all like to live in zone A. But if you want to find out, you know, if you have a friend or relative and you want to know what zone they live in just to see if that's a safe place to go, um, you can go to our Know Your Zone website. So www.knowyourzoneva.org. Do you have any of that on your publications? Yeah, it's yeah. on our website, okay. um, the Boston County. Yeah, we have some other materials. Okay. So you go there and and uh, you'll go to this uh, page right here, and you'll just type your address in, and it'll zoom right in to where you live, and it'll say you live in zone A, B, C, D, or A, B, D. Get to the end here. Let's figure out one more slide after this. Take a risk. One, find out, you know, do you have flood insurance on your home? Uh, if you don't, you know, consider getting it. If you have a federally backed mortgage, you're going to have I mean, it's required. So, uh, but if you don't, if your home's paid off, you really need to think about getting it. Um, even if you don't live in the flood zone, the, uh, if, if you don't live in the flood zone, your, your risk is actually lower and the premiums are lower. I, I live on the eastern shore and uh, I'm right on the water. Uh, you know, the water is about a couple hundred feet from the house. And uh, but my house is elevated high enough when I built it that I have a pretty much, I pay $400 a year, you know, being that close to the water. So, you know, if you don't have it, you really need to think about getting it. It's not only for your property, but your contents. And if you don't own and you're renting, you still can get flood insurance. If you don't have flood insurance, what will end up happening, and if you have a disaster and you lose everything, you'll probably end up having to get a small business uh, loan from, if, if, you know, after the disaster. FEMA comes in, they have a little bit of money they, they give people to get them back on their feet. But if you can afford, if, if you qualify for a small business administration loan, you have to get the loan. You can't take the bigger pot of money. It, it's kind of seen backwards, but that's, that loan is reserved for people who cannot qualify for the loan. So instead of having to get a loan and pay it back, even though the interest is small, flood insurance is, is a whole lot better than that. Just think about that. And then also looking at, at uh, make sure you know what zone you live in. You have to evacuate. Develop a plan. Uh, everybody should have a plan, even if you don't live in the zone, if you, you know, just knowing uh, what you're going to do. If, if you're going to evacuate, where are you going to go? Are you going to go to the shelter? If you are, if, you, if that's your plan, you need to know where shelters are. Do you uh, all know where our shelter is? Peasley Middle School, which is the northern end of, well, not quite, but the middle of the county. Uh, and that's where the shelter is. Now, if it was a situation where we had to open up something closer to here. We could, but we also have agreements with Union Baptist Church and some other churches. So if you just needed to go for a little while, um, we use some of the other schools that are closer to here and things like that. Not Achilles, but Abingdon Elementary and so forth. But your primary shelter is Peasley Middle School and Bethel Elementary, which is right next door. 
and they have pet, we have a pet shelter attached um, to Beasley Middle School. So write that into your plans. If, if your plans go to the shelter, then at least need to know that. That would be known when they're open. Uh, that's going to be widely publicized. Or if you're going to go to a motel, or if you've got family and friends on the other side of town, uh, just think about that now. Uh, you don't have to, like I said, you don't have to go to Richmond. Uh, there's some people just like, I'm going to the mountains, just get away from all this. <laughs> Beware, I could follow you to the mountains too. What's the capacity for the shelter? Uh, sign up. I think Jay talked about the, the code red or your Everbridge. Y'all have an Everbridge system here where people can sign up. I'm sorry, say that again, please. Y'all have an emergency alert system where people we can do, sign up. We do, and we have information right here. It's a mass notification system. I don't know, have you all heard about that? The B Alert, we have it all over the place. Um, and you call us or you do it online and you get notifications on the weather or anything major and important. And we let you know we don't get calls uh, for random things. We don't spam, we don't sell it. But if your road is closed or there's a storm coming or there's a message that is threat is life threatening situation, we will send a message out for that. Basically, it's just to keep you informed if you were in the system from a year or two years ago, called Code Red, this is a different system that we're implementing. So people have to re-register. And we are trying really hard to get as many people as we can on there, especially if you're a caregiver or you're somebody that needs a caregiver. We really want that information so we can help planning. And then, you know, get any, you know, life insurance policy, bank accounts, make sure you have copies of those, have those with you. Um, you'll certainly need them after the storm if you lose everything. Uh, assemble an emergency supplies kit, you know, get uh, enough food, water uh, for people, for everybody in the family for several days. They used to say three days, then they used to say five days, and, and Red Cross would say one thing, and different people say the other things. So now you say a few days and let everybody, you know, be consistent. Um, cash, if you ever make a hurricane, power's out, you're really gonna need cash. I mean, ATM, credit card machines aren't gonna work. Uh, medications, if you can get a, an alternate supply uh, to have in your emergency supplies kit, especially any critical medications that you can't afford not to take. Extra batteries, uh, uh, wind up radio, flashlights, all those things should be in your, your kits. Uh, you can go to our website, I believe you all have it on your website, Red Cross has it on their website, FEMA, so there's so many places if you want to figure out what needs to be in the kit, and a lot of people just, you know, there's a lot of things that need to be in the kit when you talk about food and water. Some people just buy a little bit at a time and just build it up. But remember, I'm sure everybody remembers, when COVID hit, you went to the grocery store and you couldn't get toilet paper or a bottle of water or paper towels, it's going to be like that if we have a major hurricane. You see it all the time in Florida, the Home Depot and the Walmart are just wiped out. So get a headline, get it now. You don't, you don't have to worry about it. And then if we do have a storm, monitor closely. I mean, everybody's going to make their decision when to evacuate. Some people say, hey, I think it's coming here. I'm getting out of here. I don't have to wait for anybody to tell me. There are some that uh, are not going to go regardless. Just if you're if you're in one of these areas where we're showing you know five or more feet of, of water above ground, please reconsider that. Review the plan with your family um, and then during hurricane watch that's when you start getting everything ready. You may not need to do anything. The hurricane watch is going to be a bigger area and, and just because we're under a hurricane watch doesn't mean that we're going to see that, but if, you, if you're not going to have a lot of time, it does come here. And then there's the evacuation we're given. Don't wait. You know, the good thing is if you guys have y'all right at the beginning, you're, you're at the end of the evacuation now. So if you're in Virginia Beach and Norfolk and you got to go through everybody, so, you know, plus, you know, not most everybody's going to be on 64, but 17 is going to be busy. Uh, but, you do have the advantage of probably not being as, as uh, 
backed up in traffic to some of the other places. But but do make that decision quickly. Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, on non-tidal flooding, who pays for that? Flood insurance or homeowners? Any, any flood. Homeowners insurance will not pay for any flood. Even though it's not tidal? You can have a, you can have a, a storm, you can have a sewer line break or a water line break and it floods your house. It doesn't matter the source. It, homeowners insurance will not pay for any flood. If it's dry, you gotta have flood. If it's coming down, you pass it. I tell you, I was um, I was after Hurricane Rita, which is like a couple weeks after Katrina in Louisiana back in 2005. Katrina Rita was just as bad as Katrina, if not worse. It was a Category Four hurricane that went through uh, you know where Lake Charles, Cameron areas. Well, I deployed down there uh, for two weeks on an instant management team, and we met up with this uh, one Sunday night. We met up with the shrimp boat people, they had a shrimp boat and just come in and this is maybe three or four weeks after uh, the storm. We were down there, we were the second team that went down. And so we were talking to them and, and they, uh, during the, the storm, they took their shrimp boat up to Lake Charles to get it out of safety. They had, they lost everything they owned except that shrimp boat. They had a mobile home, they had uh, pickup, lost it all. They didn't have flood insurance. And they, I think they had evidence that the wind blew their trailer away before the, the tide came on. And all they wanted from the insurance company was a down payment on a new mobile home. They weren't even asking for them to replace it, and they were denied. So it's an insurance company. If they don't have to pay it, they won't. Any other questions? This is the last slide. We we'll talk about um, hurricanes forecast for this year. So the way they do uh, average storms, they look at the last 30 years. So we're looking at from 1990 through 2020, at the average number of storms per year. So we have an average of 14 names from, these are the averages we'll use for this decade. When we get to uh, the next decade, they'll, they'll shift that, that uh, those 30 years. Normally we'll have an average of 14 named storms, tropical storms, hurricanes. Seven of those would be hurricanes. Three of those would be major hurricanes. And if you're not familiar with the, the uh, ACE, that's the accumulated cyclone energy. That's a measurement of all the strength of the hurricane. And what, what that does is, you know, you have 14 named storms, 14 tropical storms, but you have three or four of them that were, were tropical storms for a day, then they just disappear. Well, the numbers are high, but it really doesn't apply much to the energy. Or if you have a you know, a long-lived, strong Category 4 hurricane or a 5 that, that, uh, that you know, they kind of, and you have a low number of years, it can help to balance things out. So uh, we normally have a, a ace of 123. Last Thursday, uh, Colorado State, which is, they're the, the ones that do our annual hurricane forecast. Uh, they just released their initial forecast. They'll do it. Their first forecast in April, they'll update it in June, then they'll update again in August. Last year, when they updated in August, it came down. If you remember, we had nothing between 4th of July weekend and 1st and, uh, of September. We went all through July and August with no storms. So they, they um, actually had to drop that. We actually ended up with a, right about an average season last year. We were forecasting above average season. This year, we're looking at a little bit uh, under average, so we're looking at 13 named storms, six hurricanes, two major, major hurricanes, category three or above, and an ace of 100. So that's good news, but it only takes one, right? So if you remember, Hurricane Andrew was in a year with a very few storms. Hurricane Andrew happened at the end of August. It was the first storm of the year. So keep that in mind when you hear it doesn't matter whether there's a busy year or a slow year. It only matters if we get a hurricane here. And then these here are the, the names of the If any of y'all have your name up there, or, uh, if you've got something to look forward to this year. With that, um, that's all I have. Uh,
tonight. Um, contact information here, or you can call Jane. And so, I guess we'll start off is, uh, we have a few questions. Does anybody have any questions about anything we didn't cover? That either I can answer or Jane or Ashley? Yeah, I got a question. Uh, I live on the Southern Wall Road. I've lived there for 75 years. For 40 years, I've been trying to get the road elevated in one little area that everyone that lives on that road has to go through. I've been successful to get it raised one inch in 40 years. What does it take? I mean, everybody that lives on that road is affected by the power of flooding. Now, we get a full moon to walk across the road. And we don't have a supervisor living on that road, so that's. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Can we say that one for you, Bruce? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so. Right up your route. It is. So the the issue with with that road is, until we have a title event, and this is how I mean, we can ask VDOT, and I'll, I'll bring it up to Mr. McKnight, who is our regional person for VDOT, and tell them, hey, we we we've got some concern down here. Um, Unfortunately, same thing with Little England. Little England's not going to get much help either, no matter how much we try. The issue is, and, and the money that FEMA has only becomes available if a storm washes that road out. I mean, it has to be, it has to be caused by a storm. Um, the damage has to be done for us to get that money. Um, VDOT will not come and do anything for any of our roads like that until there's a bigger issue. We, we've tried. I mean, they went and did some work down at Little England, but that road is simply just because the edges of that road are falling off into people's yard. Well, that's the problem we have also. You want to ride down into where trucks Oh, I've, I've been down there. I've driven through the, I've driven